to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. My message is entitled, This Treasure in Earthen Vessels. This is part two. This Treasure in Earthen Vessels. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 5 through 7. So when you find it, please stand up, stand up for the reading of the Word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. Part 2 of this treasure in earthen vessels. Paul says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. This treasure earthen vessels. Father in heaven, the Holy Spirit would bring forth these truths, Lord God, that you'd open up our hearts and minds and our understandings, Lord, that we could apply these things to our lives and we could understand this wonderful truth about this great treasure that you placed inside of us. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen, and you may be seated. Part this treasure in earthen vessels. Now, ladies and gentlemen, last week I told you that you can always tell the measure of a man by what it is that he truly cherishes and treasures in his life. Some treasure their family and friends, some treasure money, some treasure uh, pleasures and homes and cars. And I told you there's nothing inherently wrong with any of these things as long as they do not take priority over this treasure in earthen vessels that God himself has placed within us at the moment of our salvation. Amen? And we saw that this thesaura, treasure that God speaks about, or whereof Paul speaks, is the divine gem. It's the divine jewel. It's the pearl of great price that God has supernaturally deposited inside the Christian body when we got saved. Now we learned that this divine treasure that's placed within us is the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that is now living inside of us. And we've learned, ladies and gentlemen, that this divine treasure inside of us is also the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say amen? You just thought the gospel was just a message, amen? And this divine treasure placed inside of us is the actual moral and spiritual and eternal life of the living God that is in place inside of you and inside of you and inside of you and inside of me, inside of all of us if we have been saved. You see, beloved, this led us to point number one, the perishable containers that I spoke to you about last week. For we have this treasure, he says, in earthen vessels. Now Paul calls our frail, feeble, finite, mortal bodies, notice, nothing but flimsy, Fragile ostrakinos skuos, earthen vessel. That's all they are. That is, they're like cheap, brittle, breakable clay jars and pots and vessels, and they are just as easily replaced as those things can be. Now, yet God has chosen our temporal mortal body, our clay pot, to be the sacred repository, to be the sacred receptacle, to be the sacred retainer and container of this infinite divine treasure of his uh, that he's placed uh, inside us. And that, by the way, dwells in us right now on this earth. Amen? Can you imagine God is placed inside of us on this earth? People are looking everywhere for God. Guess where he is right now? He's in you and in me and all of us. You see, what am I saying? The Greek word I taught you last week, God placing that uh, divine treasure in us, he places it in us like a corpse is played, placed in a casket. In other words, or like a plant or a flower is placed inside of a pot. That is, we're like those temporal and dispensable containers that we have a brief period of usefulness, beloved. We, we are little worth in and of ourselves, and we are just as easily replaceable when we break down and die. Right? Why? Because we do not have it yet. We have it in promise, but not in actuality. That will happen at the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, beloved, we're going to fall apart. I talked all about that last week, and I'm not going to get into that anymore. 
But I told you last week that in the midst of dying, also in the midst of dying. And I told you what happens in your body in this here is that when you're young, you have more cells that are being produced every day and replacing the dead cells than are dying. But as you get a little bit older, that process flip-flops inside of you and you start having more cells that are dying than are being able to be replaced. Amen? That's called autolysis of your medical labor, but that means you're dying, so on I. So we're all dying, beloved. The fall of Adam and Eve, I told you, brought God's curse of death upon all men, and the Bible teaches that God will not reverse the curse until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Now, I spoke to you a little, about, a little bit about clay pots in Paul's day. And beloved, in Paul's day, clay pots and jars were so cheap, they were so inexpensive, so insignificant, that even the most poorest of people had many of them. In fact, they used to take them, vessels, put their treasures in them, and bury them in the ground, bury them in the backyard. And by the way, that's that's probably safer than a lot of banks today. Amen? But why did they do that? These, because these clay pots, ladies and gentlemen, were, they were common. They were temporal. They were expendable. They were easily replaceable, beloved. And by the way, so aren't we. Listen to me now. When those clay uh, pots broke, you just discarded and disposed of it and then easily replaced it with another one. No one ever tried to fix a, play, a clay pot. A clay pot, when it, try to say that fast, clay pot, clay pot. <laughs> you can't. A little salt there. They didn't take out the little tube of soup. And then you go, and it goes, multiply, <laughs> right? Now, beloved, what they did, they discarded it. They disposed of it. And then they went and got a new one. So Paul reminds us that this divine treasure in our earth those are clay pot bodies. That is, the light and knowledge of the glory of God and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is the primary vehicle and whereby God has chosen to reveal His divine glory and salvation to the world. And beloved, we ought to make every endeavor, every effort to let this divine treasure in us so shine before men, shine in us and through us to all men. And Paul shows us that it's not our earth vessels that are valuable or important. It is the divine contents. It is the treasure that's in us that is. Would you say amen? A lot of people live like their body is the most important thing. When God said, if you're a Christian, the most important thing in your life is that divine treasure that has been placed inside of you. Come on, say amen out there. Okay? So we need to get a heavenly perspective on this. Amen? Now listen to me, beloved. We're nothing special. Paul says he was nothing special. Paul says he was nothing but a clay pot, an earthen vessel amongst other earthen vessels that were likewise sharing this divine treasure to all men, letting their light shine forth, preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says that's what's important. That's what's uh, invaluable. You better do it while you still can because you're going to get older. You're going to get sick. One morning you wake up and something will be wrong. Isn't the way it comes on you? You go to bed healthy, you wake up all of a sudden in the middle of the night, the next morning something's wrong. And all of a sudden, your life is taking a turn. And that's going to happen to all of us, by the way. I've always prayed, Lord, let my eye not grow dim or natural force of be like Moses till I get through preaching and whatever I got to do. Or Caleb is 85 years old. He says, ah, give me the sword, Joshua. I'm strong as now. I can fight just as good now as I could when I was 40. Can you imagine 45 years later, this old time, I come on, come on, cut you in half. <laughs> Right, you know, talk about having some chi in them. <laughs> Bioelectric magnetic energy, that's what it is. <clears throat> Anyways, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying God says, what I want you to do with your clay pot, with your earthen vessel, with that wonderful divine treasure that's inside of you, I want you to let my love shine forth to men. My life, my glory, my salvation, let it shine bright so all men can see it. And so this is what I want to speak to you today on point number two. I want to speak to you about this divine treasure. We saw point number one, the perishable containers. Now I want to talk to you about the priceless contents. I want you to look at verse 7b. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7b. He says that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. I want you to notice here the precious and the priceless and the invaluable contents and power and authority of this divine treasure that's inside 
of you if you are a Christian here today and you name the name of Christ. Now, folks, listen to me. It gives us earthen vessels both eternal worth and also the Greek phrase is literally hyperbole theos dunamis. That is the excellency of God's power. What did you say, preacher? Hyperbole theos dunamis. God says, and that's, I, I don't even have time to explain that to you, be honest with you, ladies and gentlemen. But I'll give you a cursive understanding of it. That is, God has put within us the supremacy and superiority of his supernatural power and authority. And God has placed within us the primacy and the ascendancy of his supernatural power and authority. It means God has placed inside you and me the supereminence and the preeminence of his divine treasure, his power, his authority. Why, beloved? I'll tell you why. So that by uh, him working in us and through us, beloved, now we're able to call men. We're able to convert men, consecrate men, uh, change men's lives, sinful men, ladies and gentlemen, and make them sons, saints, and servants of his through the anointed gospel message and power contained in and proclaimed by us frail and feeble earth and vessels to all the folks in this world. Whew, that was probably one of the longest sentences I've ever written. <laughs> I normally, when I, when I put my notes, I just abbreviate and I... Oh, never mind. Anyways, uh, beloved, now men can be partakers of the divine nature just like us because of God, what He's doing in us. Think about it, beloved. Now men can be morally and spiritually and supernaturally changed and transformed because of what God is placed inside you and me. Did you hear what I just said? Their destinies can be altered. Beloved, listen to me now. Now men can be uh, given new hearts and new minds and new lives because of the divine treasure in us. Is it any one? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, therefore, in light of all of this, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, now we're able to, uh, these other men are able to be blessed inheritors and benefactors of the merits of Christ's redemption on the cross so they can be saved and sanctified. Why? Because of what us earthen vessels are in. Imagine, beloved, the God of the universe who governs all things says, I have decided that you mortal, frail, feeble, finite people, I'm going to work inside of you. I'm going to put my power in you. I'm going to put my anointing in you. I am going to live in you, with you, through you. I'm going to do it. Beloved, I, I don't know what would be better. I, I can't think of anything that could be better. Could you? Oh, beloved, listen to me. He's saying now men can be able to be resurrected. Listen, now be able to be given eternal life in an immortal glorified body and live forever with God. How, beloved? How is this possible? Because just like us, God has placed the divine treasure in them now. You see, beloved, through the anointed gospel messenger or divine treasure that's in us, men can finally be saved, reconciled, reconnected back with the almighty, infinite God of the universe. Would you say amen? You see, folks, I, I, I want you to pay attention to me, beloved. God, I don't want you to miss this. And although everything I just said to you is true, I'm not lying to you, we truly under, need to understand this fact, that this far suppressing, this transcendent supernatural authority that resides in us belongs not to us, it belongs to God himself. In other words, it does not originate within us. It does not come from us. It does not from us. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying it comes from God. It belongs to God. He has placed it in us. He is working through us. Would you say amen? As mortal and frail as this earthen vessel is, God says, I'll work in you. I don't care if you got perfect health. I don't care if you're the best looking person there is. I'll work in you. I work in Paul. He was an ugly, red-headed, bald-headed, squeaky voice, scarred, gnarled, Man, but I worked in him, and nobody else had the anointing on him like Paul did. It doesn't make any difference whether you've got big muscles like Pastor Joel that are soggy chills. It doesn't make any difference. He says, I don't care who you are. 
It's not your ability. It's your availability to me. Submit and surrender. And I'll work in you, with you. Empower you. Put my hand on you. I'll anoint you. I want this treasure. So what am I saying? I'm saying we're only able to do all of these miraculous things that are exceedingly, Paul says, far beyond measure in anything that I feeble imagine only because, hear me now, because it is God's supernatural power and authority and divine energy working in us, beloved, that is infinitely greater than any electrical power, infinitely greater than any uh, atomic power or th- nuclear power. Beloved, listen to me. That supernatural power God has placed inside of us that these other things can't even touch can change a man's heart and change a man's will and change a man's nature and change a man's body and change a man's eternal destiny. Would you say amen? And grant him eternal life. What other power can do that? You can launch a rocket. I don't care where it is in the world. You can obliterate the earth, but you can't change their lives. You can't give them eternal life. But that little treasure inside of us, speaking through the most humble clay pot and clay jar in this room, can do it. Oh, what a wonderful gift, amen. Priceless, invaluable that we have privileged to be able to do this. You see, beloved, but belongs only to God and not to us. It's God's power. That's the message. You hear me? It's God's power that's the message. It is not the earthen vessel. It is not how beautiful you look. It is not how strong you are. It is not how chiseled your body may be. I told you, I had six bad abs. I got a keg now. Okay? But I had six pack abs. I had a pack. Literally, I, I was always in pretty good shape. But now, I've got everything I can do with the girdle on and everything to look normal. I don't have a girdle. Probably should have helped my back, right? But you see, beloved, the fact of the matter is you're going to age. And that's why you've got to make hay while the sun shines for the Lord. You've got to do it now. You have no other chance. Why you got your health? Why you got your strength? Why you got your marbles? <laughs> Now's the time to do it. You see, beloved, we have no inherent power to do things like this. I have no inherent authority or personal magnetism to do things like this. And listen to me, all you folks are getting caught up in this law of attraction. I was in that when I first got saved in 1974. Positive thinking, all of that, beloved. But let me tell you something, beloved. Those things can't do one thing for you. Even though it's touted by all these heretical gurus out there who champion things like the power of positive thinking or the movie The Secret that came out a few years ago, beloved. That's old That's old news. Nothing new, but because of social media now, everybody can get a a handle on it, see it, and get hooked by it. You want to know why? Because of our fallen, covetous, greedy hearts. We want what we want. We don't care whatever happens. We just want it. You listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. You listen to me. This is of the devil himself. You hear me now. This is of the devil himself. Jesus said this devil was a liar from the beginning. This is trafficking with demons. This is New Age shamanism and occultism, which is nothing but a revival of Old Age shamanism and occultism, beloved, that's sophisticatedly wrapped up so we can deceive multitudes who want everything in the world so they can embrace it. That's what it is. It is demons working in you. You do not have the power, an alchemist, to attract things to That is simply what the occultists always taught. When I first got into the martial arts, beloved, I was 15 years old. That's what they taught me then. And that's what they teach to a lot of martial arts. I don't teach that. I teach you how to be able to defend yourself just in case. You know, you preach like I do, you have to defend yourself. (laughs) You mean amen, David. Come on now. (laughs) You see, beloved, it is strictly forbidden by God condemned by God. And God says all those who practice that will be summarily condemned themselves. Now I don't want to step on anybody's toes, those on television or whatever, but that's just a fact, beloved. Jesus said this, without me, you can do nothing. You hear that? Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Now Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, but Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. In other words, they're saying that man has no inherent power of his own. It either comes from God or it comes from the devil. 
But if you're a Christian, the power you have comes from God. Would you say uh, amen out there? What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying someone's lying to us. You see, beloved, either, it's either Jesus or Paul or those who practice and promote this law of attraction and this power of positive thinking. What say you? Is it the heretics like the George Steins or the uh, Creflo Dollars? What say you? Is it the heretics like the Kenneth Copelands and Gloria Copeland and Benny Hinn and Jesse Duplantis? What say you? Is it the heretics like the Joyce Myers and the T.D. Jakes and the Bob Proctors and the Norman Vincent Peels? I read that book, uh, Think and Grow Rich, The Power of Positive Thinking, when I was 17 years old. And I'm only 29 now, but, but, it, but all that saying. But, beloved, I was a young buck when I read that. And, boy, I said, boy, I got that kind of power. That's great. Guess what I found out? Now, you don't know me, beloved. You really don't know me. And my wife would tell you, and, that's, and I'm not boasting, good, bad, or indifferent, I am the most disciplined man you know until it comes to eating. <laughs> when I say I'm going to do something, I do it. And I will do it, and I will stay with it. I'll be like gum on your shoe until I get it done. It may not be great, but it'll be as good as I can do. And I did it, and I did it, and I did it, and I did it, and I visualized, and I, I had the board set up, and, I, and guess what? I got Stugatz. <laughs> and my father's words rang true. You want something? Get to work. <laughs> Let God bless you. My old man taught me that. You see, beloved, what are you saying to me? I'm saying, what is it? Is it the word of the Lord you're going to believe or is it going to be these gurus who do nothing but try to get rich off of you, tell you all kinds of things because Satan knows our greedy, fallen, covetous hearts wants what it wants. So you'll buy anything. Just send $1,200 and I'll show you how to attract the riches of the universe. <laughs> you might as well start a campfire and go, <laughs> you know, it's just amazing to me, beloved. It's just and so many people are caught up in it. Instead of trusting the God of the universe, this divine treasure that you have. Listen, beloved, I want you to know what Paul and the apostles preached. Look what he says in verse 5. For we preach not ourselves, he says, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servant. Now notice what he says here, for Jesus' sake. In other words, beloved, they preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and not themselves, unlike the false teachers today and those teachers there at Corinth were doing when Paul wrote this. Paul said that he and all the apostles, all the other Christians, were but humble servants of the Lord and his people, beloved, not some gurus who were preaching themselves that were trying to get rich like people are doing today. Because our hearts, beloved, see, Satan knows we, are, we have this concupiscence. That's the, uh, I, won't, I, I don't have time to go into it. But it always craves what's forbidden. It always wants something, and we will shove our brains trying to get it. I saw so-and-so did it. You know, that movie started up, and they, 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 you know, and they just, oh, good, and he's rich right now, so they must come to me. Blah, blah. Yeah, okay. Let me ask you a question. God says, did God say in the Bible, I make men rich and I make men poor? Does God say that? See, God decides who's going to be rich and who's going to be poor. Doesn't God say, I make some men healthy and some men sick? You see, beloved, it's up to God. All we can do is what we can do and trust the Lord. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm simply saying this. That Paul says here we are not to preach ourselves. We are not to promote ourselves. We are not to praise our but give God all the attention and all the glory just like they did. And we are not to add to or subtract from the gospel message or be afraid or ashamed to preach it, beloved. The words are already anointed with God's supernatural power and authority by the Holy Spirit and by His grace. Amen? Now a lot of you are thinking, I'm not articulate enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not anointed enough. It ain't you. It's the message. It's the treasure. That's anointed. If you hear me, ladies and gentlemen, good night, good night, good night. All we have to do is turn it off. All we have to do, ladies and gentlemen, is let the tiger out of the cage. You know, you can see him. He's going back and forth. Open the door. Go. You're saying to me, preacher. I'm saying all we have to do is 
preach it, and now let God do the work, calling men, convicting men, converting men, changing men, consecrating men. How does he do it? Through his mighty and miraculous supernatural power and authority. It's upon the word. Would you say amen? I'm saying we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Listen to me. You know, you know this. That people would give everything they had just to have some supernatural thing that would guarantee them an encounter with the living God of the universe and make them right with them. Everything that they had. You know, you know it, ladies and gentlemen. That people would get everything they had that just to have some supernatural guarantee that, uh, uh, in them that all the miraculous changes in their hearts and natures and lives and they could be changed into a brand new person and they can be all they can be. You know, they'd give anything to be able to have that. Amen? I mean, that's why they're doing what they're doing on TV. Taking exercises, doing this, fasting, cutting their heads off, freezing them. 40 years down the line, the cryogenics, that you're going to... Yeah. Yes, hi. Um, I just want you to know we have the sharpest uh, saw when we, uh, when we cut your head off. <laughs> and the coldest freezes, too, so you'll be okay in 40 years. <laughs> Can you just see they're going to mount it in the freezer? We're going to have to cut that tongue down a little bit. <laughs> I mean, can't you just see it? I mean, how stupid can we get? All you got to do is reject God, reject his truth, reject his knowledge, and you'll f*** for anything that they want to uh, put before you. Beloved, I'm saying people would give everything they had, everything they had, to have some supernatural thing, like have a resurrected, immortal, glorified body, and be giving eternal life you can live with. God forever and ever. Bless be God. What I'm saying is that they'd give every dollar that they had to have this. They'd give every dime, every penny, every breath that they had to have this. Are you listening to me now? They'd even give their family and friends. <laughs> Some of you are saying, who wouldn't? But they'd even give their 401ks and their savings accounts. They'd even give their investments. If they could just be guaranteed that they'd have all of this, what do you say out there? Why? Because they know that to be absolutely certain and guaranteed that you can have immortality, that you can have eternality, that you can live forever and ever is the foremost desire in every person's life. God has bred the desire for eternity in us, said in the book of Ecclesiastes. He is putting eternity in our hearts because we see, ladies and gentlemen, we can't get it down here. We can only get it there working through us. Would you say amen? But God has placed a desire inside of us so we'll seek him inside of these earthen vessels. And it's priceless. It's an invaluable treasure, but incomparable commodity that you'd give anything you had just to have this gift. Yes, beloved, we have this treasure in earthen vessels right now. You hear me? This gospel message is like a grumbling and rumbling volcano that's just ready to erupt and spew forth the very lava of supernatural the very lava of supernatural transformation, the very lava, lava of supernatural change and immortality and internality. It should be bubbling and gurgling inside us. I want to tell you, I can't stop. It. Boy, I'm so excited. I know I'm going to, I know I'm going to live forever. I know I'm going to have a glorified body. I know it. I've got this treasure in earthen vessels. Come on and see a man out there. Yeah, I got it. What a priceless contents that's been placed inside of us. We have it. So that's point number two, beloved. Point number one, the perishable containers. Point number two, the priceless contents. Now, point number three. I've got 15 subpoints to this. No, I'm not I tell you that because I got three, and, and then you won't feel too bad. The perseverance commended. Now I want you to look at verses 8 and 9. He says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Beloved, listen to me. When you both hold and behold God's glory in you, you just have to tell others about what you've seen and what you've experienced. Amen? This is what brings us into such 
a clash and confrontation with the unsaved and also, beloved, such suffering and hostility from the world. They can't understand us at all. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God because they are foolishness unto him. Where you and I, we have this treasure of life unto life in us, amen, but they death unto death. You see, beloved, we have this great hope. We don't sorrow as others which have no hope. But if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also that sleep in Jesus with God will be with him. So we don't sorrow like the world does. But I, I, I can honestly tell you, I never, not one week of sleep have I ever lost about whether I die. I may die right now. The way I feel today, it wouldn't bother me one bit. I'm not a spring chicken anymore. And it takes a lot to get up and preach and teach. But you know what? I, I, I'd rather burn out than rust out. How about you? As long as God gives me the strength. As long as he gives me a fire in my belly, I'm going to keep preaching. I lose my mouth. <laughs> what, what? <laughs> you say, preacher, you've already lost your marbles. Right? Yeah, but I found them in Jesus. I'll tell you right now. But you see, beloved, that divine treasure makes it so we just can't shut up. That we can't stop doing it. Why? Because of the divine treasure inside of us that supernaturally sustains us and strengthens us in the spiritual battle. And it also spurs and goads and prompts us to keep on shining as God's witnesses. And more, it also prods and pokes and pushes us ahead to the finish line so we can inherit the eternal blessings. Amen? You know what I'm talking about. There's been times when you want to give up, but you couldn't. There's been times when you want to throw in the towel, but you couldn't. You said, that's it. I've had it to hear with this Jesus stuff. He says, no, you haven't. He's pushing you and prodding you and poking you. See, beloved, that is that divine treasure in you. You're a child of God. You're going to live forever and ever. You're not going to throw these blessings away right now. I won't let you do it. I won't let you do it. Yet because of Satan, beloved, is the fly in the ointment, is the God of this evil world system, and because we are so counterculture, he's going to send his fiendish dominions and minions to constantly and continuously hound and hurt us. So don't you be surprised to constantly and continuously attack and assault and assail us, to constantly all kinds of tribulations into our life to discourage us with the and difficulties that do indeed cause us so much pain and suffering. But why does he do it, beloved? Because he wants you to quit the race. But why does he do it? Because he wants you to desert from God's army. So when you go through it, beloved, you shouldn't just have your head in the sand. See, there's something supernatural and spiritual that's at work here. Not the external circumstances. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high or heavenly places. So don't shelve your brains. Don't put your head in the sand. Be like the camel who pokes his nose into the tent to see what's going on. Yeah. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? Satan wants you to not fight in a spiritual battle. I don't know about you. There's just something in me that stirs me up. And I said, what? Who does this guy think he is? Now, I'm like, I used to have a rat terrier. She was just a little dog. Her name was Ruby. What was her name? Ruby, Ruby, I've been thinking, what in the world have you been drinking? Smells like whiskey, tastes like wine. Oh, my gosh, it's turpentine. Okay. I had a little dog named Ruby. And when I first got her, my, Ellie's got a, 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 a mirror in her, her uh, office. And it goes from the floor up, right up to the ceiling, so Ellie can look at the top of her. Okay. No. It goes up about six feet. So Ruby comes walking in one day. <laughs> and she sees herself, right? From that day on, Ruby thought she was bigger than a German shepherd. <laughs> you think I'm kidding you. A German shepherd walking in there. <laughs> I'm telling you, you go underneath them, the German shepherd know what to do. But let somebody go to the front door, and I got a little wash. She runs over, looks, goes over. I got a box. She goes, flips it up, grabs a ball, drops it to the person right at the front door. It's time to play. I'm not going to chase you out of here. I'm a dog, but I love you. 
there's just something inside of me that's like Ruby. A little, the tenacity of that little rat terrier. You know the terriers all have tenacity, amen? And I could go on with that, but I'm not going to. You know, beloved, what Satan wants us to do is lose our soul so we'll be condemned with him in the end. But bless God, 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he that is in me than he, the devil, that is in the world. Infinitely greater. Greater is he that is in me than in the... Well, you know the rest of it. You see, beloved, God's Holy Spirit and his divine treasure within us is greater than Satan. It is greater than demons. It is greater than problems and afflictions and adversities, beloved. It's greater than all of the sufferings you may ever had, and it stirs you up and spurs you on so you can keep on. Keep it on with the Lord Jesus Christ, amen, until you finally overcome all your enemies and you finish your race and you inherit eternal life. And the sooner you realize it and the sooner you believe it and the sooner you trust it and the sooner you acknowledge it, beloved, the more power you have, the more hope you have, the more strength you have, would you say amen? Instead of wondering, is God with me? Does God love me? Does he care about me at all? That's what's saying. Where does all that doubt come from? The Lord, the Holy Ghost, the Word of God, or the enemy of God? Oh, why don't you settle some things? Settle you in your heart. It's like getting married. I've been a long time now. Very long. <laughs> but you know, I settled in my heart when I got saved. I mean, I get married. <laughs> Listen, my wife asked me to get married. You remember that? <laughs> So any trouble she has, it's her fault. <laughs> you see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying all of our sufferings in this life, Paul goes on and shows us, are but temporal. In other words, beloved, they're fleeting, they're transient, they're transit transitory, they're short-lived, they are not perpetual, they are not uh, permanent in our life. And the sooner you come to acknowledge that, the better off you're going to be. It's going to be tough living for the Lord. Why shouldn't it be? You've got eternal life. You've got immortality. Why shouldn't it be? Amen? Oh, beloved, listen to me. I want you to look at verse 8 and 9 again. He says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Now get this. Sure, we may be troubled. That Greek word literally means to be squeezed, pressed, or pressed on every side and in every way in life, but we must never, ever let these things so distress us, depress us, discourage us, and crush us so that we'll quit and give up. That's what Paul's saying. Listen to me, beloved. Sure, we may often be perplexed. The Greek word literally means confused, disorientated, bewildered. Have you ever been there? You may be that in life, like that in life, but we must never let these things leave us feeling so totally and utterly hopeless and helpless and desperate so that we'll give up. And Paul says, sure, you may be persecuted. That word literally means wronged, mistreated, victimized in life, but we must never let these things uh, ever make us think that God is now abandoned or forsaken us so that we give up and we quit. Why? Because Hebrews 13, 5 promises all those who persevere that God will never leave you nor forsake you. Settle the truth. Internalize it. So you can exit. Amen? See, a lot of you read it, but you don't believe it. You don't make it a part of you. Hey, beloved, I... how to say this. You can believe everything you want, but if it's not a part of you, if it doesn't alter your course of actions, the way you think, or whatever, it's nothing. All it is something you read. And that's why you have to, Lord, help me. Lord, I go on and on like that. So you can know what you're all about. Would you say amen out there? Then Paul says, sure, you may often be cast down. That Greek word means to be struck down, to be knocked down in life. But you're to never let these things ever destroy you or strike you down and out, beloved, so you ultimately lose your soul. The Bible says when you are knocked down, a righteous man falls seven times a day, but the Lord helps him and he gets up and he keeps on 
going. He doesn't stay down. He doesn't wallow in his pity. He doesn't wallow in his discouragement. Boy, if anybody had something to be discouraged about, it was the Apostle Paul. I mean, he would not only have nothing physical going for him, all right, but looking at the circumstances, it almost looked like he was a failure, like Jesus. But he wasn't. Jesus knew he wouldn't be. My brethren, I'm going to dwell in the midst of the church, he said, <laughs> even though everybody had forsaken him, okay? But he knew, see, he was able to look down the corridors of time and trust in the promises and in the power of Almighty God. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying, why? Because God says, I want you to get up, and I want you to keep on trucking, and I want you to keep on fighting. If you only got one hand and you're down, do what you got to do with one hand. Kick, scream, bite, hit few other things you can do, but I won't tell you. Why, beloved? Because of the supernatural power in our earthen vessels, Paul's saying it supports you, and it sustains you, and it drives you onward so you, uh, you can't be beaten, you can't be defeated, beloved, because God promises all of his children he'll always cause you to triumph in Christ if you will but believe him. He'll always cause you to triumph in Christ, if you'll believe Him, beloved. But you have to believe on Him. You have to rely on Him. You have to depend on Him and not yourself. You have to trust in Him and trust on Him, ladies and gentlemen. And you have to persevere in the faith. And as you do, this indwelling, resident, supernatural power and authority of this divine treasure in you will be constantly and continuously begin to enable you and empower you and change you and give you hope and give you help and all of that. Come on and say amen out there. See, that's what God will do. Now, beloved, I told you that's the reality of suffering. That's my sub-point number one. Number two point, I want you to look at verses 10 13, the reaction to suffering. The reaction to suffering. We've seen the reality of suffering. Now the reaction to suffering. Look at what he says in verses 10 through 13. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. How often does he do it? Say it again. Speak with me. Always, that the life also of Jesus might be manifested in our body. The more you die, the more it is manifested. Amen? Paul said, I die daily. That means he was living more daily, too, for Jesus. Amen? Jesus was living in him, with him, through him. He says, for we which live are always delivered unto death. you got a death sentence on you, physical and spiritual. For Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal bodies, in our clay pots, in our earthen vessels. So then, death worketh in us, but life in you, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, way back there in the Old Testament, all the way back there in Psalm chapter 116, verse 10, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore we speak. Now, beloved, notice this. Do you get the picture here? I mean, look at your text, brother. Do you really get the picture of what he's saying to you here? Like Paul, our desire must be to die daily to self. Beloved, to share in and identify with the death and victory of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross so other people can also see the manifested life of Christ in us. That is Christ exalted high and it up, working in you, with you, through you. Not, how can I do this, and how can I look better, and how can I be this, and how can I do that? How can I be a better Christian? How can I worship for Christ? How can I serve Him better? Oh, I want to die to my wants, and I want to die to all of these different things that I've been chasing, chasing after. I want Jesus. I want Jesus to live inside of me, and I want to die daily. Just like Paul said, you see, beloved, why? So Christ's life can be manifested in you. So it can be demonstrated and exhibited not only to you, but to all others. So we must embrace our weaknesses. We must embrace all of our persecutions and our troubles and our trials. We must embrace the sufferings, the death to self daily, beloved, to exalt and glorify and magnify and manifest the Lord Jesus Christ and not ourselves. When Paul wrote to the church at Rome, he had this very thought in mind about dying to self. 
And he said this, listen, he said this in Romans chapter 8, verse 36. He says, for thy sake, that is the Lord's sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Did you hear that? Paul didn't say, I'm going around so I can be exalted on a pedestal so I can get all I want in life, so I can get rich and I can have everything that I wanted. Uh Uh-uh. I realized that when I died with Christ in baptism, I gave up all rights to myself. It is Christ that now lives in me. And I live to serve Him. I do what He wants me to do. I go where He wants me to go. You see, beloved, what is Paul saying? In other words, he's saying, We ought to allow ourselves to be mistreated. We ought to allow ourselves to be beaten and die, suffer ourselves to be defrauded if necessary, to give others this life. In other words, being a Christian, he's saying, is the sacrifice of self. Isn't it? I can't tell you how many times people try to put my feet in the fire, and they don't even know the other side of the story. And I said, okay, that's the way you feel. I said, I'm going to pray the Lord show you some other things. If that's all you're going to say is bad about me, you don't know the half of it. <laughs> you see, beloved, it's putting ourselves on the altar for Christ. It's putting ourselves sacrifice. I beseech thee, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove is that good, acceptable, and perfect. God, Romans 12, 1 and 2. You ever put yourself on the altar? Lord, I, 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 I'm not going to leave here today thinking, this is what I want, this is what I'm going to do, what is it you want me to do, Lord? I've got this uh, uh, nice job, i got some money, i I, I got a nice car, i got a nice home. What do you want me to do with it, Lord? You gave it to me. How can I use it for your glory? Amen? And thirdly, beloved, I want you to see the rewards of suffering. We've seen the reaction to suffering We've seen the reality of suffering. Now I want you to see the rewards of suffering. Look what he says in verses 16 through 18. And I'm just cursively moving through this, beloved. He says, For which cause we faint not, though, but though our outward man, your body, that outward man perish, the physical body, the earthen vessel, the clay pot, yet the inward man, that's the new man, the soul, the spirit, that new man, God, is placed inside you. He says, uh, uh, is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. We look not at the things which are seen, but the things, he says, which are not seen. Why is that, Paul? For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen? Oh, beloved, listen to me. The Bible says in Colossians 3, 1 through 4, that we are to if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, and not on the things of this earth. Why, Paul? For you are dead, and your life is here with Christ in God. For in Christ, who is our life, shall appear. Then shall you also appear with Him in glory. Come on and say amen out there. Amen? Oh, beloved, you're focusing on the TV and the new fire in the house and the da 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 Instead of saying, oh, Lord, I'm going to glory. I can't, wait. I can't wait to see Jesus. I can't wait to see God the Father and Son, Holy Spirit. I can't wait to see the saints of all. I can't wait to see the new Jerusalem. I can't wait to see my rewards. You know? <laughs> I got some gifts for you, Joel. Okay. I remember one year I had a guy come into the church, and he, it was Thanksgiving, and he said this to me. He said, Pastor Joel, I've got nothing to be thankful for. This is the truth. I said, what do you mean you get nothing to be thankful for? I said, you look healthy enough. I said, and he went on and on and on. I said, listen, what you need to do is be thankful. You, because he says, I owe money to everybody. I said, be thankful you're not one of your creditors. <laughs> That's something to be thankful for, isn't it? That'd be like squeezing blood on a rock. <laughs> but beloved, listen to me. What am I saying to you? I'm saying this, beloved. The rewards of suffering. I want you to do, note the two blessings here. The blessings of our one prospective resurrection in verse 14. Shall raise up us also by Jesus. Shall present us with you. Oh, beloved, our baptism is a pledge and promise 
of our upcoming resurrection. This is when we die and we bury the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Paul said in Galatians 3, 20 and 21, he says, for our conversation, our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he's even able to subdue all things unto himself. In other words, Christ's resurrection is a pledge and promise of your resurrection, and your resurrection is an extension and expansion of his. Amen? That's one of the reasons you're getting baptized, that pledge and promise, that imprimatur of the triune God being placed upon you. Say, uh-huh, they're mine, and this is what I'm going to do. So, beloved, that's the first blessing, prospective resurrection. Secondly, notice the present renewal. He says in verse 16 through 18, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And that's why we do our well, light afflictions but for a moment. I'm just to save time, beloved, so I can stay within the framework here. Paul's saying this, we're not to allow ourselves to ever quit or to ever give up or to ever lose heart or be discouraged and defeated, ladies and gentlemen, in the spiritual battle, even though our outward earth and our body is in the constant and continuous process of slow, slowly wearing out and dying. You know that? Because, listen, you're more than meets the eye. See, you're, you're not supposed to be looking on the temporal things. You're supposed to be looking on the what? The spiritual things. Now listen to me, beloved. In other words, he's saying, what I want you to do is I want you to open your spiritual eyes. I want you to have a, a, some vision here and fix and focus not on the visible or the physical or the tangible or the perishable things of this world like your own earthen vessel, but on the invisible, intangible spiritual realities and blessings we forever have in Christ, both here and hereafter, in heaven, in the eternal kingdom of God. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, our inward man every day draws its strength, its growth, its power for relief and deliverance by this supernatural treasure in us. Amen? I can't tell you I'm just like you, mortal as you are, frail as you are. When I didn't think I could go another step and I had all the burden of the ministry and everything else coming upon me at once. And, beloved, having to meet a deadline every week. Imagine you have to meet a deadline. Everything you do has to be within a, a blocked period of time to get it done. I know a lot of you think I'm out golfing all the time. I've never golfed in my life. Golf backwards is flogged. I probably got flogged a couple of times or flogged one or the other. But, beloved, that's what you have to do. And sometimes you say, Lord, how do I get off this hamster wheel? How do I do it? I'm not a kid anymore. I don't know how much more I can take. And God says, I'll give you one day at a time, Joel. And you know what? That's exactly what I do. One day at a time. I'm well aware, beloved, how tenuous a church is. And I don't want us, if something happens to me, I don't know who's going to be next in the pulpit, but beloved, if they're not someone who's set under the preaching and teaching of this word, this church will not be here in five years. You hear me now. It takes a lot. It takes a lot. You have to spend yourself and be spent so you can have a church to attend. Everything you do, every time and everything you do, eat your lunch in front of the computer, uh, supper on the phone, and uh, that's the way it is. And I'm not complaining. I'm just telling you all of it. Look at verse 17. He says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. In other words, he's saying our light afflictions of rejection for Christ, our light afflictions of persecution for Christ, or beatings, or sufferings, or sorrows for Christ, our uh, uh, light afflictions of martyrdom for Christ, beloved, are like an employee. What? Yeah, they work in far more glory for you, far more praise, far more honor than you're going to get on the day of judgment. Amen? They're going to work for you. All right, I'm so glad you bore up under that trial. Uh-huh, okay. Well, I want you to really put his feet in the fire because that's going to earn him some more glory. He won't quit. Now, if you have an employee like that, I'd fire him. <laughs> How about you? You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying is that if we look at all of our difficulties, all of our adversities, all of our afflictions and sufferings and sorrows and miseries and problems of this brief life, whatever they may be, and we now see them through the lens and the light 
and the perspective of eternity and the eternal glory that is to then be revealed in us, there is just no comparison at all between them. They will all vanish away. Poof! Just like that. Amen? No comparison whatsoever. But Satan has got you bogged down, focused on the problem. But they'll diminish and vanish away if you listen to Jesus. So let me close. So look into eternity and focus what lasts forever. That's pretty simple enough, isn't it? But you have to do it. See, no, God is going to force you. Lord, I'm going to discipline myself to start doing that. One day at a time, I'm going to look ahead. So, beloved, he's telling us to look beyond the veil of the natural to the supernatural. He's telling us to look not on the physical, material, and temporal, but rather on the spiritual and eternal things. Why? Because our earthen vessels have this divine treasure of God's power and presence in us. The gospel message, the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God lives in you. The Spirit of God lives in you. The gospel lives inside of you. His power lives inside of you. Bless God. Look to those things. And you know what, beloved? You say, I can't see him, Pastor. Well, they're not fully realized yet, and they won't be until Jesus comes back again. So you need to pers- be, uh, be patient. You need to persevere, ladies and gentlemen, and let your light shine daily, ever so clear and brighter and not dimmer and blurrier, beloved, while you're still at home in your cot. We have this treasure in earthy vessels. We must let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine all the time. Put it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Put it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I took Jesus as my Savior. You take him to I Jesus as my Savior. You let it shine. Oh, beloved, how we should treasure this divine treasure in this earthen vessel. Oh, how we should cherish and appreciate this divine treasure. You have this divine treasure in your earthen vessel. Do you cherish it? I pray you say, uh huh. Amen.